Welcome to this Spain online event. I'm Brian Clegg and I'm talking to Tim Marshall about the future of geography, his latest book. Uh, so to start with Tim, I wonder if you could just tell me a little bit about yourself really about how you came into this business. Oh, into writing uh, via journalism, uh, via being a tea boy. Uh, quite a long journey. Um, left school at 16, painter and decorator, building sites, this, that and the other. And um, through various chancing means, fell into, well, in five, got into journalism as a T boy, LBC, early 80s. Uh, hit a rich scene gradually and uh, became a foreign correspondent. Very happy to be paid to travel the world, see various things. And then after 9 11, it was just a sprint, and the sprint exhausted me. It was 15 years of just nothing but conflict. And mm -hmm. so, circa 2013 2014 after one too many trips to syria i thought i i can't do this anymore um and i thought what can i do so i thought well i'll i'll try and write about geopolitics and to my surprise people very kindly bought some of the books that i wrote about it and uh so where are we yeah ne nearly 10 years on and this is my eighth book well wow. yeah okay so much of your books have been had the word geography yeah. in the title. I think to most of us, geography is like country boundaries and oxbow lakes. So how would you define geography? What, what are you talking about? Well, it's it's geography in the geopolitical sense. Now, there's a whole bunch of uh, definitions of what geopolitics is, but I take it to mean that you factor in the geography, the terrain, uh, the resource resources, the uh, land that allows you to do things and land that stops you from doing things, uh, demographics. I put it all together and it, it really helps you understand why stuff has happened, what is happening now and what will happen in the future. So, you know, it's not geography in, in the sort of classic sense. Mm -hmm. It's the melding of, of geography, geopolitics and international relations and and it seems to have hit a chord because I think it does make things more accessible, uh, which a lot of people think are actually quite hard. And I argue that they're no more difficult to understand than many other things that haven't got these um, esoteric uh, uh, cachet. Sure. Yeah. I mean, do, do you think um, my background is a science writer? Do, do you think this is a scientific subject or, or is it? Does the politics bit make it rather different? Well, yeah, um, you, you frightened me now, Ryan, because um, <laughs> science, science and me, we don't. I, I love it. It doesn't love me. No, it, 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 the book Future Geography is about space, and of course, space is is inherently uh, science. But what I've done is taken that template of looking at uh, distance, time, demographics, richness, resources, and just put it up there in space. And so there's a, a word, a buzzword, is astropolitics. Mm. So it's simply looking at the relationship between the states and what is and isn't possible in space the same way as you would do it uh, on Earth. Of course, there is science in it. And I, uh, I struggled. I'll be honest with you. I, I struggled with a lot of it, a lot of the concepts, um, you know, distances and, and light years and um, velocity and you know, all the stuff that is meat and drink to you. And, and I, you know, I wanted to explain things like escape velocity of how you get out of the atmosphere. Um, and, it, and it took me, I had to go over and over and over it to try and boil it down into a way that I would understand and they therefore be able to convey. There will be one or two errors in it. I, I, I'm, I'm sure of that. Okay. Uh, when we talk about space, I mean, obviously, space is a big thing. <laughs> uh, yeah. I guess we're primarily talking about the solar system here, really, aren't we? Yes. I mean, I dabble towards the end with some fun stuff about quantum and um, warp factor seven and other seemingly impossible things. But um, yes, f for the for the purposes of, of astropolitics, you know, there's not there's no point in going beyond the solar system because we can't. And in fact, really, uh, you're only really looking at near Earth orbit, geosynchronous orbit, the moon, and then pretty far down the road, I think, Mars. And beyond that, 
uh, I mean, there's a line in the book actually that says something like, um, soon that phrase, or it might as well be on Mars, will be redundant because that will be something. I mean, obviously, I know the machines have reached it, but humans will reach it. Uh, Musk thinks by the end of this decade, maybe. Yeah, yeah. I think personally, I would, I'd throw in the asteroids as well, because not in terms yes. of humans, but in terms of mining, say. No, yeah, thank, thank you. You're, you're absolutely right. Um, and they are, of course, within the solar system, and there is this potential to mine them. But And also, the, 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 the ones that might threaten us. Um, and, you know, there's a brief mention of that, that last year there was the DART uh, where where we'd, we'd sent a, essentially a missile right out into the solar system to deflect a relatively small asteroid just to prove that we can do it. And I, I think that was quite a major event because, um, you know, it might be one in a 50,000 year possibility, but, you know, if it's in five years time, that's a problem. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So... We're bringing in the geopolitics, taking it out into space. Why is po politics relevant? You know, isn't space just about sending up nice satellites and, you know, <laughs> finding out scientific stuff and that kind of thing? As you well know, it's not, sadly, it uh, should be. The 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 concept of space as uh, the commons for all of humanity, I think, is rapidly fraying. Mm. And... In the 1960s, in the space race, I argue that that was primarily ideological. Soviets and the Americans both wanted to prove that their political systems and therefore their science and technology were superior. One was more superior than the other. And that really drove them. Now, there was a military aspect to it as well, but it was ideological. Yeah. And then it kind of went away because once you've gone to the moon, there's not much point in going back and back and back and back they did and then Nixon said why are we doing this and cut the funding now um with new technology with 21st century technology a it is as the mantra goes space is a war fighting domain all the major countries have that mantra NATO has that mantra now and also it is integral to our economies you know, our, our, our modern economy doesn't, just as you can't fight a, a modern war without satellites, modern economies don't function without satellites. So they have become more and more important. And then further up on the moon and the asteroids are the rare earth metals and the, the precious resources that we need for our 21st century technology. And the private enterprise has got involved. And so it's now accelerating into a new, well, it is a new space age. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we'll, go, we'll probably come back to a little bit more, but just thinking for a moment, you're talking about uh, whether it's mining or military applications. Up till now, I, I think it's fair to say pretty well all the business and scientific benefits we've got from space have been from unmanned probes. The getting people up there has primarily been a publicity exercise, I would suggest. Um, um, will that continue? Uh, or perhaps well, you don't agree with it. I partially agree with you. Um... I mean, obviously, the, the 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 crewed missions to the moon were, um, as I as we've discussed um, about ideology. Um, I would say that um, I don't. Th I, I think when they went in the sixties, I'm not sure they had the machines to dig up the moon rocks, which were brought back, which have helped us understand uh, the moon and 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 the solar system and the, the birth of the universe, etc. Um, also, when you look at um, the ISS, the International Space Station, and, and the, the medical and scientific uh, experiments and discoveries that have gone there, again, they couldn't have been done by machines. There was the detente uh, aspect when the Soviets and the Americans docked their spaceships, Apollo and Soyuz, in the 70s, I think it was, and shook hands in the airlock. So all that was human. But yes, yeah. where I agree with you is that because of technology, and we've sent the probes to Saturn and to Mars, and we've landed the probes on Mars, they're trundling around Perseverance and the other rovers. And we're not too far away from that, and then the robots bringing things back. That can be done through robotics. If and when we do uh, have the moon bases, which is supposed to be the early 2030s, um, things can be taken up there by robotics so what is the argument for doing it with humans um i think it's twofold i think there will be things that you're going to need 
humans to do. We also need humans to experience what it's like out there for long periods. There's a psychological aspect to that, which uh, the NASA and Chinese and Russian scientists are very aware of the, 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 the potential psychological problems and the effects on our bodies uh, for long term uh, being in space. I mean, we know there's all sorts of problems with, with bone structure, et cetera. That when you've been out on the space station for six months, you lose bone density. So there's that aspect to it. In a more potentially romantic aspect, uh, I think we, we, uh, we have this restlessness in us humans, the, the urge to cross that ocean, even though I don't know what's on the other side, to go to the top of the mountain to see what the view is like. And I think there is an aspect of that in, in in the whole space project and then on a more sort of um uh, almost machiavellian i think we might need humans to keep public interest going if you don't send humans there's so much less uh romanticism about it of course you are playing with people's lives here volunteers but you are playing with people's lives because Without the public interest, the politicians are not going to spend the money. Now, you can make the argument they shouldn't. We've got lots of things to do down here. I understand it. It's a strong argument. It's a moral argument. I think you can make strong and moral arguments for the opposite. But you're right. A lot of this will be robotics. Humans, I think, will be going as well. Yeah, I was to say, I, I, you know, I'm not against it in any way. I, I wrote uh, a book some people are. So Martin Rees. Sorry. Yeah. Right. So Martin Rees, the, 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 the eminent um astronomer royal i believe he is um he he, he argues strongly for for ro robots and not humans i think we i think we need to be there um the bulk of it robots sorry that was a very long answer um forgive me no don't worry uh so i was just saying i read a book called final frontier very much picking up on you know the old star trek theme the fact is <laughs> you know genuinely human curiosity pushing yeah. the boundaries of the frontiers it is important i absolutely get that i'm yeah. not suggesting it's a bad thing to put people in space i just think the majority of things we're going to be doing out there will be done better with and safer more safely with machinery yes uh, i mean i i mean mars i think is pretty far out you know uh, musk is on about having a million people by 2050 which i think is absolute fantasy yeah you just do the maths he's going to do 100 people at a time there's no way you'd set off the first hundred till 2030, and that's incredibly ambitious. And then just do the math. So you really, you know, a million, a hundred each time? No. Um, sorry, but the point being that as and when that does happen, yeah, you will not be sending them up until you have sent many, many robotic rockets that will land and put all the things on Mars that you're going to need to survive whilst you... And, and I think there'd probably be an aspect of that um on, on the moon and that that's near term i mean as you know the americans under the artemis accords intend to have a man and a woman walking on the moon they said 2025 it looks like it's slipping to 2026 and then they'll uh, more more people will go every year until they begin building the moon base early 2030s and i, and I think the robots will play a big a big part in that yeah and i also do accept as you say the the need for people to be involved for that public interest but then you know if you ask who john young and charlie duke were i think we're into pub quiz territory you know um that the, the the ninth and tenth people to walk on the moon and already they've forgotten pretty yeah, much you you only really know maybe two or three names not you personally people us um buzz aldrin because he he was the second Armstrong because he was the first and then maybe uh, was it Cernan the last man to walk on the moon the other nine no oh, which is sad in a way oh it is definitely yeah <laughs> that's right um so if we're looking at the come, come back and say to the military side because that's really important but just mm. carry on with the commercial side a little bit first you know, we have had huge benefits from space. So GPS satellites, weather satellites. Yes. Um, and as you say, also, there's all those rare earth minerals out there and that kind of thing. Um, do you think that this is something that is going to come primarily from business mm. or from governments? 
Yeah, I mean, that is one of the key differences, isn't it? I mean, private enterprise last time, certainly on the Soviet side, was non-existent. And mm. on the American side, was, was sort of adjacent to it and, and feeding in some equipment to the state, essentially NASA. It's very different this time, isn't it? A, a you've got SpaceX, which are actually ahead of NASA with Falcon 9 rocket and other companies. Um, they're, they're ahead of the state. There's a lot of Chinese startups as well. Um, and they are prepared to invest in order to get there first. But it is a joint enterprise. I mean, it's such an important thing that that I don't think either of them will do it alone. I don't think NASA will do it alone. I don't think SpaceX will do it. And they're already involving uh, with each other. There's a political aspect to this as well. And, and I, I, I mention it in the book. I mentioned the East India Company. Mm -hmm. As, as you know, it had its own private army. And when the Brits went out around the world, essentially thieving everything, and they took their uh, private army with them. And it became so important to the state, the East India Company, to, to, the, to the British economy, that eventually the British state sort of amalgamated the East India Company's private... The British state incorporated the um, East India's militia in, into the army. So the phrase in my world is, the flag follows the trade. So as things become so important to the economies, um, I cannot see, let's say it's Toyota on the moon. I can't see Japan leaving Toyota to its own devices if what Toyota is doing is so important to the Japanese economy. Same scenario. I don't think people yet understand that satellites are, are probably part of our critical infrastructure. We know we have to protect from cyber attack and, and terrorist attack, our uh, grid, water supplies, etc. I think satellites are in that category, which is also why I think the satellites will be armed in a few years' time. So when it becomes part of the crit critical infrastructure, the state is not going to allow private enterprise to be out there without the state involving it. So you know, I think it's inevitable that the two will 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 be uh, in a joint enterprise. Okay. And what one thing you, thing you mentioned in passing is the whole business of the idea of sort of hotels in space, space tourism, all that kind of thing. Yeah. I, I sometimes wonder is this really realistic? Just thinking about you know, the relative risk. Um, you know, going to space, it may be as sort of one in a hundred chance you're going to die. You're yeah. going on a plane, you know, perhaps one in 10 million. It's yeah. rather different, and it's not going to come together well, very soon. Well, Brian, would you go? No, no way. Uh, well, I think I'd go, but then when it actually came to it, because, you know, as you know, what you're doing is, is you're climbing up to the top of a massive, massive petrol tank stroke bomb, and then yeah. someone sets fire to it. That Yeah, that is space travel. So when it came to it, no, I don't know. I, I think I would go. Uh, I would like to go. William Shatner, um, Star Trek's Captain Kirk went. It's sort um, of. Um, just about. You just, uh, yeah, Musk and um, Bezos uh, argue about that uh, and many other things. Um, well, look, Richard Branson, I mean, I know that side of things, um, one side of his space enterprises has gone belly up, but the tourism side is still is still going on with, mm -hmm. um, and, and so is Bezos. And, uh, the, the, you know, how many people do you need when you're thinking that, that it's going to cost $250,000 per person or whatever it is? Yeah. You don't need that many and i think there are that many so i think space tour i don't really go into it much because it's it's a bit of a it is a sideshow but i i found one of the things in the research it was only 30 years after kitty hawk took off the very <laughs> first flight uh before more americans were traveling by plane mm. than were traveling by train so when kitty hawk first took off you know, you and I might have had the same conversation. Would you go in one of those? Maybe, maybe not. So I, I think we might see something something similar if it becomes normal. Because I still think going up in a plane is pretty crazy, even though I know the stats that you you mentioned. So I think space tourism could 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 be a thing. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, I thought I suppose one thing that always occurs to me. I mean, I used to work at British Airways, 
And, you know, we tend to assume technological advances means we'll always go faster and further. Yeah. When I worked at BA, we were operating Concord and you go twice <laughs> the speed of sound. No, you can't. Yeah, you know, it, it, it was backwards. It, that was a really interesting, wasn't it? Uh, it was an interesting psychological thing when Concord was grounded. Um, I actually covered uh, as a journalist. I, I covered the the, the Concord crash in in, in Paris. Mm -hmm. Sorry, that's not really relevant. Um, yeah, that was a psychological blow because yeah, we always go further and faster. Oh, hang on a minute, no, we don't. But after that hiatus which is what, 20 years now? Probably. Must be at least. Well, I'm not, so, I'm, you know, we, ha we haven't got hypersonic planes. We've got hypersonic missiles coming at Mach 5. So the technology actually uh, of man-made machines, human-made machines, I should say, are going faster and faster. So you're right, transport, and people are working on the, uh, the hyperloops and things like that, which, uh, yeah, I know. No, I, I, I think that it holds. I think we will go faster and further, but we have had a massive hiatus in in getting rid of um, of Concord and the idea of supersonic flight. Right. Yeah. Uh, one thing with with airlines, you know, there's an awful lot of law behind it, a lot of legal structures. Yes. Nationally, uh, so perhaps, perhaps moving into the more to the astropolitics side of it, um, there are treaties out there, but I get the impression that they're frankly not up to much. Um, yeah, well, look, you know, you, better. You, through your own work, you've looked into this and, and I'm glad you agree with me because I'm expecting a little bit of pushback because I, I argue quite strongly that the treaties that we have are not fit for purpose for the 21st century. Mm -hmm. um, I think as a framework and as a concept, they're great. And the Outer Space Treaty 1967 does talk about space being for the common good, for the common good of humanity. No one could own it. But I think that um, whilst that might be a framework, when you go into the detail, for example, no weapons of mass destruction, fine. But it says nothing about lasers. And mm -hmm. as you know, we now have direct energy weapons that can take down a drone from almost a mile up. And it costs you know a few dollars worth of electricity to bring it down instead of shooting a $250,000 missile at it. Yeah. So it's obvious which direction that's going to go. and now that that technology exists, like I said, I think it's inevitable they'll put them on the satellites. So there's nothing in the treaty. So either redraft it or start again, preferably start again. There's not enough in it about commerce, about commercial enterprise, because it wasn't a thing then. Hmm. If you talk about the Moon Treaty, hardly anybody ratified it, so it's not worth a candle. Talking about space situational awareness, SSA, um, we don't have a globally agreed um, framework for everybody reporting in every single bit of debris that they know about, and us all tracking it together, every single bit about satellites. Uh, we don't have laws about how close one satellite can be to another. And if my satellite is my part of my nuclear early warning system, and the great powers it is, I'm going to get very nervous if your satellite comes up behind mine, especially if it's got those grappling arms, which some of them have now, or, or nets. So, you know, we need these, these agreements, and I think we need them urgently. But is that realistically going to happen urgently? <laughs> oh, you're a hard man, Brian. <laughs> you know I'm going to probably say no. Um, eventually, yeah. You know, I mean, uh, nuclear weapons forced us to have nuclear agreements. Mm -hmm non-proliferation treaties, trust but verify, you know, checks and balances, tests. It didn't happen immediately. It happened once we realized the enormity of the threat. Um, I think in, in the space world, they do realize the enormity of the threat. I don't think that's true of the political world. And I think it's even less true of the general public for, you know, a whole bunch of reasons. You know, we haven't really discussed this. So we will go through the initial phase of... Um, uh, I mean, there is already an arms race, but which perhaps we could come to. Um, so once we've gone through the initial phases of the arms race and the initial phases of the competition to get places, um, and I'll actually I must hopefully have, we'll have time to talk about the Artemis Accords, and there's a particular clause in them that's very problematic, then, yeah, we will settle down and say, okay, look, we need rules of the road. 
We need off ramps in, in case things are tense. We need clarity. We need frameworks. It'll come, but not for a few years yet. Okay, since you've brought up the Artemis Accords. Thank you. Well, it might be worth saying what they are. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, again, this is part of, of, of the framework of the book that I am arguing strongly, or you know, pretty obvious, that the tensions here are mirrored there. So you have the, um, the Chinese with Russia as a junior partner on Earth, and that is mirrored in their relationship in space. Russia is easily the junior partner now. And just as uh, opposing them in the non-autocratic world, you have the American-led bloc. So it is in space, where I think there's about 23 countries have signed the Artemis Accords. Now, these are a series of bilateral agreements. So America has drafted them and then signed bilaterals with about 20, 21 other countries, including the, the UK, Nigeria, France, UAE, I think. But when you sign up to them, you're signing up to... Uh, the American view of what the rules of the road should be. And there's 193 countries in the world, but there's only about 23-ish who've signed up for that. But does that become the norm? And the reason I, I remember to mention them is that I think it's either Article 9 or 11 talks about when you've invested so much, I mean, billions in getting there, developing the mining equipment, and beginning to mine and finding where the resources are. I mean, we know that most of it, the South Pole region, because that's where the water ice is. There's this article that says you can declare a safety zone and you can declare how big your safety zone is. You can even declare the duration that your safety zone will exist. Mm. But the scenario is obvious. Another country, a non-Artemis country, lands very close to you and starts digging and you say, excuse me, the Artemis Accords, and they say, nothing to do with me, Gov. So um, it's all very well having your Article 9 or 11. It's another thing expecting other people to agree with it. So it's another argument about why we need to, you know, have a universally or perhaps globally agreed uh, frameworks. Okay. And as well as just these accords, presumably, you know, if you consider... Some, particularly Mars, say, as a totally separate planet, does it have to have its own entire legal framework, you know, from scratch? Well, before we get there, Canada yeah. last year changed its laws. Um, you probably know uh, on the space station, International Space Station, if, if, if in the Japanese module, the Japanese technicians invent something, it is considered legally as if it was invented in Japan. Mm -hmm. If, unfortunately, a Japanese astronaut was to kill another Japanese astronaut in the Japanese module, Japanese law applies. And for all the other countries. Canada has actually extended that to the surface of the moon. A Canadian citizen on the moon, because they are part of Artemis and they are in the frame for maybe 28, 29, to have an astronaut walking on the moon. Mm. Canadian law will apply to Canadian citizens on the moon, which I think is interesting i think they're the only ones that have done this so if you move all the way up to mars well yeah you can have the same thing but as you know from probably a million sci-fi tales there's no way in hell at a certain point the population of mars is going to take any notice of what earth says and the analogy for me is uh, 1776 the 13 colonies were saying king who you don't tell us what to do over here. You're 3,000 miles away. We're going to have an American revolution. And Musk has already written into his terms and conditions of Starlink internet system. If you sign up for it now, you're actually signing up that he's in charge on Mars, which, are, again, is quite amusing. Yeah. I mean, certainly, as you suggested, there's been a lot of science fiction background to this type of thing. There's this famous Robert Heinlein book, The Moon is a Harsh Mistress, where they... Uh, the can you, um, I'm going to write that down, Brian, because I've <laughs> been looking for... Um, oh, here it is. I've been looking for a, a, a novel on, on this. What's it called? The Moon is a Harsh Mistress. Oh, thank you. Where they, the lunar colony basically becomes yeah. dependent because they and rebels throw rocks at the Earth. <laughs> uh, so the setup yeah. would be mine. I think there's a series on um, one of the uh, subscription channels at the moment um, on, on a similar similar line. So uh, no, thank you. Um, um, I shall I'll be getting that. Thank you. Right. So if we've got 
new laws, at least hopefully preventing us from annihilation in space. So I, I suspect the military side, if you like, is liable to come first. Do we end up to start with with a kind of Wild West, you know, in terms of commercial operations, so mining, say, uh, if it is a private operation that's, say, going out to mine an asteroid, somebody else says, oh, I'll have a bit of that. Yeah. Um, I, that's liable I, to happen. I, I think it? so. I, I don't see what the what the laws are that says you can't. The Americans uh, might argue that, you know, their American law counts on the moon and therefore this is their area. Not sovereign, of course, because they would, nobody would dare say that. But, you know, that's just a word. The reality is we're in this area. Uh, U.S. commercial law will apply, you know, and you can uh, it'll keep the space lawyers in, uh, uh, in, in work for years. So th there are... The commercial side of it, it is the Wild West. It's the Klondike gold rush. And um, I don't think that's that's a good thing. Um, again, the, the leading powers that are going to be there, whether it's UAE, Israel, uh, Italy is a bit of a player, uh, Japan is absolutely a player, Russia, China, the USA, they do need to sit down and uh, agree that, you know, whoever is there in that part first we will agree there are certain boundaries that um, you have staked your claim, not to the territory, but for the mining rights. Mm -hmm. you know, and, and it is going to be, it's going to be a, a, a legal issue. Okay, you can have mining rights there for 10 years or whatever, um, this area here, and it's going to be divvied up. And, and if you don't have the laws, uh, it, it could get messy. And, you know, we are of course, dealing with an extremely hostile environment. And um, it's not an exact parallel, hardly, but I, recently the, in the Sudan evacuation, the Brits flew a plane in onto the apron to try and get some people out. But they, they in the confusion, they hadn't told the Germans and the, the Germans had a plane and they, they nearly hit it, which is exactly why you need clarity. And, and it's an even more hostile environment um, up on the moon. So, you know, you need clarity of who, who is going to be operating where, with what, on what communication systems, what signals are going out, what blinding, flashing lights, um, et cetera. Um, when, you know, it sounds a bit sci-fi, and we're not quite there yet, but I think we, we could be there within 10 years. Right. No, that's optimistic. Um, you know, well, you, you know the timeline. It's 2026 to walk on the moon again more people walking on the moon every year after that, putting in the, 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 the basics for a base, and then they want to start building a base early 2030s. Once that's up and running, then in you know, you're not building it for no reason, in comes the potential to mine. Right. It's interesting. You, you mentioned quite a few countries uh, as part of that. One place you didn't mention was India. Now, obviously, recently, you know, they had this thing about India liable to have a bigger population yes. than China soon. Now, I know financially they're way behind in terms of, you know, earnings per head and all that kind of thing. But India does already have a space program. Would you see them becoming a major player? Yeah, I, I think so. I mean, the, 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 it was an Indian probe that proved what was thought probable, which is the amount of water ice that is at the poles, you know, millions of gallons of it. And of course, in the water ice is the hydrogen and the helium three, et cetera, and the water. So yeah, the, 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 without question, I mean, they, they have uh, their own satellites, they have uh, launch capability, and they have the ambition. You need a whole bunch of stuff, uh, but if you haven't got the ambition, you're not gonna do it. Of course, you also need the money. Mm -hmm. Uh, which is a bit of a, a drag for India because, um, you know, they've got an incredibly large population, enormous problems at home. But no, I, I would say they, there's three leading powers, as you know, Russia, China, USA. And beneath them, there are the second tier powers. And you can group them all together. But if you, if you started to carve it up a bit more, you would put India towards the top of that second tier of countries. Uh, absolutely. And then you get to the third tier of countries, which is be because Musk and others have reduced the costs of getting out with reusable rockets. And parallel to that, satellites are now some of them the size of a Rubik's Cube or a, a milk carton or a shoebox. You know, they've, they've come down to that. So now the entry level 
the fee is so much lower, which is I think there's more than 80 countries now have a presence in space. And for example, um, Nigeria now makes its own satellites, cube satellites. And of course, it's a lot cheaper to send up a couple of Rubik's cubes than it is to send up a great big fridge freezer size satellite. Sure. So, you know, they, they are in the third tier. And then and there is a, a fourth tier in the developing world where, I mean, do forgive me, Somalia, if you have a space program, they might do. But, you know, once you're getting down to some of the poorest countries, then that's, yeah, no space presence. But you know, nearly half the world has a presence in space now. And presumably that makes the whole political thing even more complicated because it's not just those big three or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Um, and everyone's got these satellites whizzing around. And as you know, the new the new way of doing satellites is to have constellations of satellites. You know, Maybe you put 20 up and you fly them in a formation uh, and they talk to each other and the Earth because it gives you greater coverage. And um, th there's about 8,000 now working satellites there's lots of different predictions, but there's none of them that say there'll be fewer than 20,000 by the end of the decade. You know, I mean, they're going up rapidly. And, and that's, a, I think, a probably a conservative estimate. I mean, Musk, Musk's going to put up another 10,000 this, this decade. The Chinese are uh, building them hand over fist. Um, Brits are, are quite a satellite power, which goes back to the days of empire, because when they retreated from empire, they left behind the bits of concrete all over the world. And then they realized in the 60s, these bits of concrete need to talk to each other. And that's why the British uh, have, the military has its own satellite system. Right. It's, it's, you come back to the British empire then, and you know, with your mention of the East India Company, I did wonder if there's a power, potential parallel with, if you think of what's happening in Ukraine at the moment and the way that it's not all actual official Russian forces that are involved. Yeah. But we have these groups, dubious groups on the side, as it were. Could the same thing apply in space? That's that I hadn't, you know, I hadn't thought of that. Um, somebody, somebody being rich enough and powerful enough and, and having that capacity and then actually a, a private, sat, a private armed satellite system I don't think that would be allowed. Hmm. You work for BA, you know that if you want to take off from a country's airport, you need permissions and licenses and all sorts of things. I cannot see uh, the United States, for example, which has its own launch capacity. And you know, I don't know the ins and outs of it, but I know if you need to have a license to take off in a plane, you're going to need a license to take off in a rocket. I cannot see any state allowing it. Well, I actually have just thought of one particular state. You never know. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, that's a now that's a really good um, talking point. Um, there would be a restriction to it because the Wagner Group, which is what we're talking about in yep. Russia, there is um, something in diplomacy called plausible deniability, where you know, yes, it's absolutely a wing of the state, but there's no paperwork. Plausible, we can deny it. It's not ours. And that's how the Wagner Group tends to operate now. It's one of the most implausible, plausible deniabilities you could have. So it'd be pretty implausible to say nothing to do with us, Gov, if there was a sort of space Wagner Group. And any state that did that would know that they were sparking the arms race. They were accelerating it. So I think there would be restrictions, but you, you have thrown up a fascinating scenario. You've reminded me of another one as well. In the first few days of the Ukraine uh, war, when the, as the Russians were invading, they knocked out the base stations for a large part of the Ukrainian internet, especially in the Irpin region. And it was Musk, it was SpaceX that flew in uh, his, his uh, terminals for the SpaceX, um, excuse me, for, yes, for the SpaceX um, Starlink system, distributed thousands of them got the internet back up and running, allowing people to talk to each other again, but also allowing parts of the Ukrainian military command and control to get back up and running and then target Russians and kill their military. Mm. So, again, this is the sort of thing we don't have treaties about because 
they didn't have the technology in the previous century. But um, does that make Musk's, does that make SpaceX and its satellites a legitimate military target for the Russians? Discuss. I don't think we are discussing these things, but perhaps perhaps we ought to. The Russians got very angry about it. They, they didn't even name um, SpaceX. They just said outside commercial actors involve themselves in military activity is a very bad thing. And then they let it go. It is said they tried to dazzle the Starlink system. And it is also said, and neither of these two things are proven, that somehow SpaceX were able to not be dazzled uh, by the uh, things that the Russians were shooting at them. Which again, I, I'm not sure, Brian, I don't know if you agree. I don't think the public, the general public, mostly is aware that you can now fire um, beams of light at satellites mm -hmm. so that they can't see anything. Um, it sounds very sci-fi. It's happening. Yeah, absolutely. So we're seeing, you know, encroachments, little people testing the edges of what can we do up there in terms of perhaps yeah. if not disabling other people's satellites, uh, certainly knocking out your own satellites or whatever because they might not be unsafe or whatever. Is this likely to go further before there are treaties? You know, are we going to see anything serious happen, do you think? The French are openly talking about arming their satellites mm -hmm. uh, with lasers. And of course, I mean, the reason you can't really shoot down a satellite with a laser from Earth is because the beam has to go through the atmosphere and it gets weaker and weaker. Dazzling, yes. Shooting them, no. But the French are already talking about that potentiality. Um, the more dual-use satellites there are, which is, as I said, the ones that have got the grappling arms, which are very good machines to get rid of defunct satellites, mm -hmm. get hold of them and throw them into the atmosphere so they burn up, so you're getting rid of space debris. It's a good thing, but it's dual use. You could be actually creep, creeping up behind someone else's satellite to attack it, in which case satellite A wants a defensive mechanism. We're not there yet. We're heading there. On the what's called the direct ascent attack, uh, where ballistic missiles have been fired from Earth and blown a satellite up, I don't think there's going to be a treaty, no, uh, in the, for the next few years. And it's because the American, the four countries can do it. The Americans have said, this isn't good. Let's have a moratorium on the testing of such things. And the Chinese and the Russians have said no. And the reason is that they know that their, their ground forces are not up to scratch the way that the American military kit is. But they also know that where they do have parity is in the ability to shoot down satellites. So they're not going to give up their ability to shoot down the American satellites, given that they have you know, they're as good as the Americans at, and they know how important the satellites are to the military until their ground forces have parity with the Americans. And then at that point, they might say, yeah, we can all agree, let's not do these testing, but until you get there. So you know, th this is why we're in this, this difficult period. Um, I haven't actually thought of this, whether it's the, I mean, it won't be an exact comparison, but the, the early days of 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 a potential for nuclear war, you know, we were groping around and trying to find how to do this, and I think that's probably where we are now. Okay. We, we mostly talked about countries here, but do things like you know, United Nations, NATO, do they have, they have any input responsibility for making this geopolitics work in space? Yes, um, well, so the NATO countries now talk to each other. Um, uh, France has got a space command. The UK has got a space command. Germany has just launched a space command. America had the first one, I think, Space Force. And then NATO realized, ah, so they haven't got a space command that is in control of all of NATO's space assets. They have a space command that um, is a sort of central clearinghouse so that all the NATO powers that have space assets are aware of what everyone else is doing and so can, can coordinate and coordinate and swap and, um, and imagery and, and um, targeting and da dangers um, coming around the corner. But of course, there's not much of a relationship with the Russian Space Command in that. So there's these different space commands that uh, don't talk to each other 
um, they are they are again they do talk uh, at the UN about how to bring us all together uh, it is a work in uh, progress but of course that progress excuse me of course that progress has been uh, somewhat delayed shall we say by the Ukraine war okay so that, that that's kind of like like the space command side I was thinking with the UN say has that only place in I don't know putting oh, treaty sorry yeah. Like yeah. yeah I mean yeah you know they they there are various offices at the UN headquarters uh, in New York that that are deal only with space and yet we need them because as and when the great powers are ready to talk to each other here is the forum in which they can talk about this subject and there are experts at the UN ready and waiting and and they draft their own proposals and put out their reports and some of them might even be read but not very many of them right okay I mean I guess in some ways if you, th you think about climate change that the UN was involved in that from early on, yeah. uh, it's only relatively recently, I guess, the in, the input uh, has, well, has that strong impact. Maybe it's the same kind of thing over time. Mm -hmm. it might be no, that's, a, that's a really good point. Um, yeah, the, 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 the UN has been going on about this and the dangers and space debris and all the rest of it for a long time before the great powers uh, began talking about it. You mentioned climate change. Um, you know, this is one of the potential positives of, of, of um, space exploration, the potential for having resources without despoiling the Earth, mm -hmm. and also the potential. I mean, you, your your book is the final frontier, so you you may have covered some of it of 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 harnessing the sun's energy and deflecting it down twenty four seven. Um, uh, one of the problems on Earth now with with solar panels is that they only work when the sun's shining. And um, we don't have the technology to store any excess energy in these massive batteries because they, we can't do it yet. But there's no night and day out in space. So you could be beaming them down all the time into panels which feed straight out into grids. So, I mean, that's a few years away at least, but that's another reason why it is not futile I know resistance is futile, but it's not futile uh, and it's not a waste of money that's going out there. Yeah. I mean, how we mentioned climate change, I mean, one very clear thing, certainly in the UK at the moment, for instance, is there's a lot of protesting going on. You obviously don't seem to be getting the same level of protesting about things in space that could be dangerous. Um, mm. And you mentioned also, you know, there's some of these things the public isn't aren't particularly aware of. Do you think there's apart from everybody buying your book, do you think there are ways we should be actually getting the message out there? Um, you know, not teaching children perhaps about Oxbow Lakes, but teaching them about space? Yes. Uh, no, very much. Um, you know, it, I think it is becoming slowly, people are becoming more aware of just how integral uh, space is to their lives. Uh, and I also think that there'll be a map, I mean, Musk has, has done a lot to popularize space. I mean, you know, obviously he's a Marmite figure. Some people loathe him, some people love him. Nevertheless, he has engendered a, a renewed interest in space. And I'm confident that if NASA Artemis meets its 2025 now stroke 2026 deadline, and we we another generation watches a man, and this time a woman as well walking on the surface i think that will spark a huge interest huge interest in space and will with it will come more understanding and with that will come more debate about the rights and wrongs what we should and shouldn't be doing and where where the uh, where the investments should be pointed at mm -hmm. so i suppose some aspects of this have been a bit negative shall we say <laughs> you've mentioned a positive in terms of you know energy climate change and we've also mentioned mining is there anything else you see as you know benefits we could be getting from space but we aren't yet but in the future we are going to get they are legion but i don't know what they are uh -huh. that famous quote by arthur c Clarke, a uh, sci-fi writer that said um i paraphrase we have as much idea and understanding of what there is there and what it will do for us as a fish understands electricity um 
I, th I think we, we, we are dimly aware that there are more miracles and wonders uh, and we will learn so much. And I think it will be ultimately beneficial to us. Um, in the very long term, we might need a plan B or a planet B. And, uh, you know, the, the time to start is now. It's not uh, in 300 years time. So I think there's a lot of positive stuff. And, and you know, I, I haven't gone into it much in the book because the book primarily is about astropolitics. It's about international relations. But the scientific and medical advances that space has given us are many. And that that is that is continuing now. And we will learn, you know, we're learning lots of things about the effects of radiation on, on the body, which will be of great help to us. We're, we're learning how to build human tissue because it, you, you can actually experiment better with it uh, in, in zero gravity than you can on Earth, which again will really help people uh, down on Earth uh, now and in future generations. So I'm actually quite positive about a lot of things. I know we spent a long time discussing some of the potentially more negative things, but you know that's the nature of when you discuss international relations. But you know, there's a lot of good news out there, and it's just such an exciting time. It's it's uh, you know I'm I'm uh, I'm invested. Uh, I'm I'm absolutely agog to see what is coming around. I was going to say coming around the corner, what is coming up and down. <laughs> okay, um, I think to be honest, that for me is the heart of it you know getting that balance that if you are looking at a subject like this and it's all about the nightmare side the potential of things going wrong then it's quite sad because yeah. science and technology can do so many good things for us um yes things can go wrong but we do need i think to think of the good sides as well all technology nearly always brings negative sides as well as positive sides and i mean the, the great example i sometimes use is the gutenberg press mm -hmm. um in the what a fantastic invention in the years after it, it came out, people started writing books allegedly proving that witches were real and lots of women were burnt to death because of it, I mean, which is a terrible and absolute tragedy. But it doesn't mean that you would argue necessarily that, that we should have done away with the Gutenberg Press and it should never have been invited. You can make the same argument about Twitter. That one, maybe. <laughs> yeah. I mean, some people would say, I mean, you've mentioned Elon Musk quite a lot. Um, and obviously also Jeff Bezos, as a hand in this, that it's all about, you know, tech billionaires toys, really. Um, and it's not really about people. Is, do you think that's unfair? I think it can be about both. Mm -hmm. I mean, they both are visionaries. You don't have to like visionaries um, or their visions, but they are visionaries. And um, I, I think they're... Uh, Whilst it is ego and boys' toys and and all that, um, I think that they can still um, advance uh, humanity's understanding of what we are and where we are and what we can do. And Bezos has this vision uh, that we will be living in cities in space. But unlike Musk, whose timeline is 2050, Bezos is talking about two or three hundred years away and I won't bore everybody too much with the Lagrange points but L5 several tens of thousands of miles away is one potential place where you could hang a massive space city with a hundred thousand people living in it but he knows that the technology is not there now uh, but it might be in two or three hundred years and we might need a plan planet B or a plan B and he, Bezos's company, Blue Horizon, is already has on the drawing board uh, technologies that he knows he will never live to see come to fruition, but ca that can be built on. Mm -hmm. You know, he is planting a tree for great, 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 great grandchildren to sit in the, under in the shade, and I, 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 uh, I think that's more than just boys' toys. I, I think that's someone with a vision and, and uh, has some humanity and is, is is looking ahead. Yeah, he probably wants a statue, but fine, you can have a statue. But, you know, he's putting into place things now which could help people in two or 300 years. And um, that's human. I think we've pulled together both the negative side and the positive. Uh, I'm glad we finished on the higher um, note. Thank you. Yeah, no, it's been fascinating for me and uh, really enjoyed speaking to you about it. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Tim.